Okay. Okay. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Robert Dejarik from Temple University, Japan. I'm extremely happy to welcome our friend Ken, who many of you know. Obviously, you do because that's why we got such an enormous RSVP level. Um, Ken will uh, speak for about 30 minutes uh, without notes, without PowerPoint. Um, yes. He's a great Shakespearean actor. Without facts. Without facts. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> um, we we wait. We expect you to make them, <laughs> to give us the fact. Um, and afterwards, we'll have our usual uh, discussion. Uh, just uh, a few things. Uh, if you didn't, are not on our mailing list, uh, we have a box where it's just outside <coughs> the rooms where you can leave your business card. And I think we'll also have a donation box if you want to support our programs. Uh, if you have a mobile phone, you can put it on uh, Vibrate. And uh, Ken, you're obviously speaking on the record. So uh, you can feel free to, to, quote, to quote and misquote him. Uh, so Ken, thank you so much. Hi there, good evening. I guess the first thing I have to say is that if I <laughs> There's a good old girl. If I'd known that so many people were going to be coming today, I promise you. If I'd known so many people were going to be coming today, I promise you I would have spent a lot more time in the five years that I was here learning something about this country. Okay. But uh, uh, indeed, uh, it's too late for that now. Um, as Robert said, I'm going to be speaking without slides. I'm going to be speaking uh, perilously without facts. Uh, I'm going to be uh, trying to start a conversation. Before I do that, however, I want to thank Robert Dejarek uh, for the community that he has created here at Temple. Uh, as a foreigner arriving in Japan, you start falling into lots of different buckets and lots of different communities that help you out. Probably one of the most important for me in Japan has been the one that he's created here at Temple. I've usually been on the other side, I've always been on the other side of this, uh, listening to all of you, since many of you are speakers here as well, learning about different things. It's been incredible for me to understand Japan through that lens. There is a view as well that my remarks here today are somehow going to be the culmination of five years of uh, looking and reflecting upon Japan and answering the question of what is Japan. And I can also guarantee you that that is not the case. It represents five years of complete bafflement about Japan, with which I now leave with complete open questions about this country that I simply cannot understand. But indeed, I do want to start a conversation about, and I think that there are some important themes that we can work through together and think through and see how the future is going to look. Instead of taking a, a stake in the ground, what I want to do is start this conversation and look at Japan and try to reconcile two different views about the country. The first view goes like this. It's the view that Japan is poised for a revival, or as some argue, or one person at least argues, that there was never any crisis or problem to begin with. Uh, in the in full disclosure, I should ask, is Eamon Fingleton here tonight? <laughs> I take that as a no, so I can, uh, I can go forward. So I can go forward more easily. So the view of revival uh, sounds like this. Uh, we see every evidence of it everywhere. Uh, if you crack open an iPad, you notice that, you know, although the casing might say Apple, it might be made and assembled, rather, in China, that the parts and many of the most important and expensive parts come from Japan. It's all made in Japan. Uh, we see that and we know that. We know that Samsung may, may make the most uh, LCD panels and televisions per year, and that Taiwan has one of the largest semiconductor industries in the world, but both South Korea and Taiwan run trade uh, deficits against Japan because of all the materials that they need to buy, all the fine chemicals with which they can actually make the things that they sell. Uh, likewise, um, I am struck by the words uh, vibrating in my mind by an old Japan hand who had been here probably 40 years uh, in a variety of different roles who uh, riveted me when I first got here as we were walking along Marinichi. And after a long lunch explaining to me Japan and, and what I needed to know, all encapsulated from one generation to the next, his parting words were sternly looking at me and said, don't ever bet against Japan. 
And I still think that when I walk along Marinucci and I see the speed with which it takes down a building and then puts up a new building and think, I can't imagine this happening in any other country that I know of. Couldn't happen in America. Can't see it happening in Europe. God forbid it should happen that quickly in China. Uh, that uh, there's something very special going on here. Some things that uh, is somehow invisible, imperceptible, uh, but, still is, but still exists. That's the view of revival. On the other hand, uh, there is the view of uh, Japan is on a one-way ticket down. Uh, that it, is, it has these uh, headwinds that are really insurmountable. Uh, first among them, demographics. Right? Just we know that demographics is destiny. This country is, is aging, but also losing population. Population is incredibly important for productivity gains. Uh, and you can see the stagnation of the economy through the lens of, over the last 20 years, through the lens of population data. And you can just look at the future and extrapolate and see the huge problems that it's going to face, of course, in terms of industry, getting talent, um, paying for Social Security, in which you have, what, like 1950, something like, Okay, my first fact, let's see. It's been a while since I thought about these uh, facts. Something you guys have shouted out if I get it wrong, but it was something maybe about six, maybe about six workers for every retiree in about 1950. And it's about to drop down to about three and eventually two in the next 25 years. Okay? So you can just see it's going to put enormous strain on the, on the pension system. Uh, of course, um, tied with that is uh, the largest public debt. Uh, in the world of any advanced economy in the world, all domestically owned, so that there's a, an enormous amount of breathing room, but still, the debt still exists. It doesn't tax this generation, but it taxes their children and grandchildren. And of course, a stagnant economy. Um, other headwinds look geopolitical, um, or at least geoeconomic. Consider China, right? There's the fear that China and other BRICs are going to do to Japan what Japan did to the West in the 20th century. The, it seems that, in fact, there's almost an ideological uh, headwind as well, and that is that Japan was able to benefit in the 20th century because of its, the power of the developmental state and these large industrial conglomerates. But it seems like those are the, the two features of the modern economy, of the 21st century, that really don't apply very well. That instead of these, you know, the developmental hand, you want to have a, a much more of a laissez-faire approach, and instead of large industrial conglomerates, you want small startups for the innovation that they have, for the job creation, etc. Now, between these two extremes, it seems to me that there's a middle position. Uh, this is not to say that um, this, is a, this is somehow non-committal or that it's wishy-washy, but it says that if we look at, at the macro scale, it's not the right or the appropriate way to think about it, that we actually have to go lower down as well and look at it on a granular level. And when we do that, we see that two things can coexist at the same time. That uh, we can see that a possible future for Japan is that the country bifurcates into both extremes. On one hand, you'll have a handful of global winners, outliers or outperformers, that will have extraordinary technology, extraordinary profitability, uh, extraordinary growth. By any metric you want to look at, they'll be doing great amid a sort of sea a detritus of, of a crumbling, ailing uh, economy, society, business sector, uh, where, where it's characterized by underperformance, however you measure it, and that in fact is withering. And you can break down, perhaps, uh, this sort of way of looking at it, both in terms of the company, uh, in, di in different companies, in terms of different locations in the country, and also in terms of different uh, industries, or different sectors. We already see facets of this today. The first is how else would you explain Toyota can be the world's number one car maker, has problems with profitability, but makes the most cars in the world, uh, amid uh, a steel industry that's been suffering from profits and has to merge to survive. Okay. Uh, think of the major electronics companies. Uh, they are dying. Right? In the, uh, as the economist reported a couple weeks ago, uh, since the year 2000, they have lost two thirds of their market cap. Now, there's lots of other metrics that might be more appropriate to look at in terms of why they're dying, but all you have to do is say, look at NEC. One great example of what is, at one point, was one of the most important uh, telecom and IT companies in the world. 
uh, in the year uh, 1990, the Harvard Business Review swooned that this was the most, you know, one of the most important and interesting companies in the world because it could dominate so many fields in, uh, in technology. And it's basically a dying shell. There's very little left to it. At, this, uh, at the same time, as you have companies like the major electronics companies in NEC, you have companies that make things like, well, you have a company that makes something called BT Resin. BT Resin is, a, is made by Mitsubishi Gas and Chemical, and basically it's a polymer used to attach little bits onto a semiconductor. If you don't have BT Resin or a substitute product that is a little bit like it, that's made by Hitachi Chemical, you really can't make a uh, semiconductor. So, the, if you will, the world uh, relies on Japan Inc. Two things coexisting at the same time. Uh, we, we all saw the importance of corporate Japan in this respect after 3.11, when the global supply chains shuttered to a halt simply because people couldn't get these same strange sorts of chemicals that in what had been considered a backwater for Japan, Tohoku, was, uh, was sort of the center of so many small and different little widgets, such as you know uh, microchips that go into cars. Sometimes these paradoxes exist inside companies as well. So there's two companies in particular that deserve this. Oh, yeah, thanks. Hello, is this better? Okay. I'm going to just start, I'm going to start from the beginning. I apologize. I was expecting a podium where I could look more closely at my notes, but you're going to have to now see that I and speaking off from those. So sometimes these paradoxes exist inside companies as well. So two companies come to mind. The first is TDK. Everyone remembers TDK because everyone bought the cassettes, the, uh, <laughs> you know, the VHS tapes, etc., that we have from it. But the reason why they made the cassettes is because they're specialists in magnetic technology and ferrous technologies. They made the magnetic heads. So TDK is a bifurcated company. It, has, it makes the world's capacitors that go into lots of different little you know, products of Japan. Any electronics needs you know, maybe between 100 and 500 little capacitors if you're a stereo or something like that. They make no money on it. In fact, they take a terrible loss on it. At the same time, they make the heads for disk drives. There, they've got huge profitability. It's a difficult business to be in for lots of reasons, so I don't want to make it, out, make it seem like they're an absolute champ. They're not. Uh, and they have to struggle each year to do well, but they do extremely well by it. Uh, extremely well means that um, they can eke out oh yeah, about 5% profitability each year. That doesn't sound like a lot, but in IT manufacturing, that's actually not bad. And we consider they're saddled with a hugely loss-making electronics division that has really no hope of doing well, and they probably should have exited a long time ago. That's extremely impressive. They can actually hold the company together. The second example of that is Olympus. Right. The, as everyone remembers from reading all the articles most recently about the corporate governance scandal, the media didn't know how to respond, how to talk about Olympus. We referred to it as a camera maker. But everyone who knows Olympus knows it doesn't. Yeah, yeah it makes cameras. That's not what Olympus is today. We've got 70% 70, 70 market share in the wireless endoscope market. It's a medical device maker. Right? The camera business is unprofitable. The money is made from endoscopes. Now, you might say, well, that doesn't sound like, don't, doesn't sound too abnormal. I want to suggest that this contradiction doesn't exist quite as much in other companies and other you know, economic traditions. For example, uh, in the West, you wouldn't have a company tolerating something that was wildly unprofitable with no future, while at the same time uh, doing extremely well in another area. You'd either fix it or sell it, and then you'd want to concentrate your resources on your winners. But that's not what, corp what Japan did. Whether that's going to be the direction of corporate Japan is secondary. My only point is that when we look at Japan today, we see features of this bifurcation. And even when we look at companies, we see these features too. Within Japan, we can also see companies that are just what, what the global laggards look like. So think of Kintetsu Railway. Over the last you know, 10 or 15 years, it's had a 0.2% return on equity. It it's basically make, makes no money. It's propped up on bank loans. Banks love it because railways are very cash flow positive. I mean, the notion is that people pay for things. 
in real money as they get out and as they board it, and so that they can pay back their debts over time with low interest rates, they can, they can survive. It's not a great business to be in. It's always going to kind of look a little bit shabby, but that's what you know, the old Japan looks like. And we see this, the old Japan and the new Japan coexist when we're in Tokyo Station. Right? On one side, we look at Marinucci, and we see these beautiful office towers that are you know, towering to the sky, new ones mushrooming every day. On the other side of, uh, of Tokyo Station, we see just the opposite. We see stories that are basic, uh, buildings that are usually about five stories tall, at a time when the earthquake standards probably mandated that it be that high. It was built probably in the second or third generation after the war, so that's, dis well, I mean building generation, not human generation. So it's probably about 1970s, maybe the average age of these buildings. Uh, and you really see, you know, to yourself, this, this sort of thing. But just going, just being in Tokyo, and then going out on the train, you know, 30 minutes or an hour, you see the same sort of bifurcation, right? In you know, Tokyo, you've got, you know, extraordinarily beautiful uh, restaurants and uh, cafes and hotels, and you go an hour and a half out of out of the city, and you'll be in places that look like Sarajevo under the siege. <laughs> so we can see it within Tokyo as well. Go into a smoky detour or one of my beloved Uishima coffee shops, and you see the stark contrast that you have. We see that department stores have been having lower sales for about 20 years, while Uniqlo has been soaring and has been uh, having uh, aims to be the largest retailer, clothing retailer in the world. At least that's in Isan's goal. You can see that in Laux, a company that had been ailing and kind of on a bended knee, it's a big electronics retailer. Not only were they acquired by a Chinese firm, they then struck deals with a famous department store in Ginza, where now all the Chinese stores are buying from them. They've got wonderful sales, and in some ways it's a frightening harbinger to the Japanese of how their economy may go, in which it took you know, the, the, the polish of a, of a Chinese company, as well as the links that they had with which to attract new consumers who are coming into Japan to flourish. And we even see this with, with the Kadon Red. Right, the, another kind of vestige of the old Japan. It's the Japan uh, that rallied in favor of TEPCO after 311, after Fukushima, and actually, as a policy, resists a competitive energy market. Right? I want to say that again so it sinks in. You have a business lobby of large industry that does not want competition in the energy market, versus the new Japan on the other side, you know, maybe the, gold, the global outliers that I'm referring to, Mikitani-san of Rakuten, left the Kanon Ren after 311 because he just saw them as a bunch of dinosaurs that were actually strangling his country. And of course, Masayoshi Son of SoftBank said, you know, we cannot wait for the government, we cannot wait for you know, large companies to sort of improve the uh, market for energy. I'm going to just build solar panel projects uh, in, the, uh, in the hinterland and hope for the best. And so he's starting to do that now. Now, this idea of bifurcation applies also to locations. Obviously, the population of Japan is declining, but the population of Tokyo is increasing. Right? Scale is, 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 Tokyo is aggregating for scale. Right? The rest of, of, of Japan is atrophying, but this place is sort of capturing, within that decline, is capturing prosperity. We see this in the wealth disparity of the regions. Uh, in Tokyo, the per capita income is 4 million yen. In Koichi, the per capita income is 2 million yen. Exactly half. And the idea also applies to different sectors. So thinking about it in terms of uh, material science, it looks like it's very promising for Japan. Stem cells, obviously, they've done very well. Automotive seems to be extremely strong for Japan. Uh, Lots of different players still doing very well. Unlike you know the electronics industry, which does look like there's overcapacity, and it looks like the uh, although the, it, it would look like on the surface that the electronics industry uh, has lost the casing, but has won the insides because if you, you know, obviously crack open the iPod, you see so many in the iPad, you see so many made in Japan wares. Uh, you might think that. Um, that it's a story of intermediate goods in the electronics industry where they're doing very well, as opposed to final goods where they can give that to others. Intermediate goods, they might be able to protect profits. Final goods, uh, their profitability might be actually a lot tougher. 
Now, I say all of this because I think a lot of you are probably being skeptical, and with good reason. The fact is, this sort of analysis is not fully coherent. It's actually a little bit misleading. Right? We would have, in, let's look, for example, specifically, and I'm thinking specifically now, of what constitutes the sectors that would do well. If we think about it in the United States, right, by about 1980, and then certainly by 1990, 1995, we would have presumed that the electronics industry, and specifically the computer industry, was not a very good one to be in. There wouldn't be very good profitability. You'd want to kick it off to your Asian rivals. You would want to innovate elsewhere and go up. Right? But that was before Apple came in. In fact, Apple was dying uh, before Steve Jobs came back to it. And it was really in the revival of 1999, 2000, 2001, that changed the fortunes of it. And now it actually looks like there's great design in America and that you can have great innovation. Relying on Asian parts and, and made in Japan parts, but it, it, it looks very good. Secondly, if you crack open an iPad today, um, we have to see there's obviously a brand new iPad out. It's going to be very interesting to do the teardowns to find out what are the products in it. But the truth is that although the, we're living in the past when we use Apple as an example of one of these great companies that has Japan incorporated inside of it, it's true. Many of the, product, many of the bits inside of Apple products come from Japan, and many, many of the very best bits do as well. But you have to look at it not as a picture, but as a, as a movie, right? as a moving image. And when you see it that way, over the last 10 years, the share of Japan inside Apple products has actually been decreasing. Right? And the winners have been notably Korea and, to a lesser extent, Taiwan. Why I say all of this is that it's going to be clear that by putting forward this sort of um, this idea that you're going to get bifurcation, the first thing that comes to mind is going to be, so who are the companies that are going to do well? What are the cities that are going to do well? And what are the sectors that are going to do well? Well, it's going to be easy to talk about the cities, right? You can say Tokyo, you can say Fukuoka, and you can see geo you know, geoeconomically why this would be the case. No mystery, right? And you can look at companies, because that's really facile as well, right? I can say Toyota, and I can just look at any very strongly. I can look at Nidec. Uh, a great maker of little industrial motors that go into everything like um, uh, the movable locks and doors and movable seats in cars, and say, well, they're going to do very well, and I'm just sort of retrofitting my analysis to those people who are winners today. Um, that's, all, that's all true. The fact is, when I look at it in terms of a sectorial-based approach, there's absolutely no rhyme or reason for who's doing well and who's not. And then when you look at it uh, on a corporate level, and you think about the lesson of Apple, you realize actually it's very humbling. You realize actually I have absolutely no clue um, why some companies in Japan do very well and other companies don't do well. A lot of people look at it and they're going to point to different things. So let's think about what some of these things are. Uh, the first one is going to be uh, combinatorial innovation. There's an analysis that says that when innovation can be done within a group, in a koretsu, and when it's vertically integrated, it suits Japan because they develop strong ties with people. There's tight relationships that, dirt, that last for a long time, as opposed to the more open innovation model in the West, in which you have combinatorial innovation. Um, you can have interchangeable parts, not uh, physical parts, but even kind of virtual parts, and even almost a mental mindset of business relationships with others. That would, that's almost I don't want to say impossible for Japanese companies to do, but it seems to be very difficult for large Japanese companies to have that sort of open flexibility of recognizing their business being like, um, like a punk rock concert in which they're bouncing off someone one day, bouncing off another another day. But if you look at how Western companies, and particularly Silicon Valley companies, do their work, that's what their business relationships look like. They have no problem with that sort of um, inherent um, pragmatism or opportunism or just at least open rapport. The, uh, th that's, that's one. Uh, the, the second way of looking at it is going to be looking at different little cultural traits. So you can say, well, you know, are, the are the companies more global? Are they more open-minded? Uh, do they have more Harvard MBAs? Do they you know, mandate that English is spoken at their, at their business meetings? That's pretty useless as well, it seems to me. I, I've not been able to determine that there's any relationship at all in terms of corporate performance and the fact that people have MBAs from American business schools versus have just been you know, started you know, business, or rather started their company uh, on April 1st, like everyone else, in a, in a cheap suit and a bad haircut. And then just, I, I don't mean to, I'm a journalist, so I don't mean to criticize cheap suits or bad haircuts. I'm a beneficiary of those very things. But uh, you got the idea. But you just kind of march, march forward uh, and, into, and into the sunset and, and leave the company so many years later. 
The next way of looking at it is, um, is it, are they not hierarchical? Are they, do they respect younger people and not, and not senior positions? Again, I can't really see it. I mean, you see, it, it's sort of all across the map. Uh, obviously, um, NEDEC is a, is a global um, powerhouse in making these small little motors. Places run by tyrant, uh, so it's not like he's sort of open-minded. Um, he's very, very Japanese. Uh, he uh, is very hierarchical. I mean, he's not Sergey and Larry of Google. Right? The, the, the final way of looking at it is uh, the notion of the smile curve, right? And this, this is the sort of um, stuff Albert is here tonight. So he knows all about the smile curve, which is you have, um, looks, the curve looks like a smile, and here you've got uh, parts, here you've got the final product, and here you've got services. So you've got the life of a good in its supply chain or it's in its commercial cycle. So you put a lot of parts into it, and those parts have high profit margins. That's why one side is smiling. It's kind of very low. The nadir is where you're, you're just going to slug it out at the electronics retailer. And up here is where you're servicing it, or you're adding little, little add-ons to it, um, maybe a, um, a casing for your iPhone, and you've got high profitability. And maybe that would explain, uh, and for some people, why Japan would be doing well or not. But that doesn't work either um, for a variety of reasons. Just trust me on it. It's, it you, you wouldn't really be able to code for that and, and kind of decrypt the mystery of why you'll have some great companies in Japan and why you won't have others. Okay, but <clears throat> the point is that uh, if, if this comes to pass, um, what we might see is a sort of a splintering or a fracturing of the Japanese economy, and that's going to have severe implications. The first is going to be uh, in terms of Japanese national identity. Um, obviously, Japan prides itself on having a very egalitarian community, a very egalitarian society, and it sort of lived on that, um, that belief, that myth, uh, for really the post-war era. In many respects, um, it's, no, it's more than a myth. I mean, there's a lot of legitimacy to it. The Gini coefficient data from the OECD that shows income disparity is, it is bearing that out much less. It's showing a much more unequal society, but um, still, when we saw uh, a few years ago when uh, corporate presidents had to disclose pay over one million yen a year, I think a lot of people were really surprised. Of course, the Japanese media made a huge fuss of about 100 CEOs who were getting over a million dollars a year. But for those of us in the West, you know, the foreign correspondents looked at it and were like, oh my god, there's only 100 people who are getting 100 million dollars a year. It, it, the salaries were so off the charts on the downward side for global compensation, that it looked really laughable. And it would seem very strange for um, the CEO of Nomura to talk to his counterparts at other investment banks, knowing he's making just a smidgen over a million dollars a year, and others are earning um, far times, far much more. Not to say that that's good. In fact, I think it's repugnant. But the point is that, it, that, that you're going to at least see, if this bifurcation takes place, you're going to see these extremes, this sort of drawing out to these different sides. And, Again, we already see this. You, the, the idea of the society of disparities uh, is a term coined by, um, well, it's a term in Japanese, but one that made was the cornerstone of Jeff Kingston's book, Contemporary Japan, that came out a few years ago. Um, so although it, it's, it's been there, it's, going, it's new that it's going to have to be acknowledged. It's going to take something that already exists, and it's going to make it much more overt that's going to be less escapable, if you will. The second thing is there's probably going to be a fracturing of social harmony. Um, I don't mean that in a very um, simplistic way. I think it, there's more subtle ways. It, it wouldn't be like riots in London or the Occupy Wall Street movement, um, but it would be a small degree of tension, a small degree of, um, and that tension would need a release. I think it, it would be hard to have these sorts of extremes without it getting bottled up and without it um, eating at people. The world, again, was really impressed with Japan. I mean, it was almost astonished at the way with which Japanese society handled the Fukushima disaster in particular, and here in Tokyo most of all. I mean, for all of you who are here, you remember that life really went on like normal, and there, it was eerie. Um, it, on one hand, it was a little bit frightening that we were all, or I shouldn't say we were all, but that it seemed like there was a degree of sleepwalking by, uh, by Japanese society. On the other hand, I can attest from my own society, America, that if a similar thing had happened at a large metropolis, we would have been tearing each other with our fingers, you know, 
altogether. I mean, like the looting would have been intense, and I would hope that's not the case, but we can only imagine that, that, that that's a, a real possibility. There's an incredibly strong society in Japan, right? Didn't take me five years to figure that one out. The, uh, the second sama still exists. They're, it's still governed by unwritten rules and mores of people watching each other. There's a strong sense of community. Those communities have rules and it, it, it regulates uh, behavior on lots of different levels. Um, we see this all the time uh, as foreigners and you know, speaking to my Japanese friends, I intuit that uh, I only see a, just a small smattering of it on the surface and there's something very deep and very positive to this sense of community uh, that regulates mores and behaviors and attitudes and norms. Um, however, uh, what we may see is that this frays a little bit in the future if we have a society uh, of extreme Japan uh, where you have global winners and you have others. The third thing is the, is the effect on the economy. Uh, will it make a Japan that is, is risk averse? Certainly if you have uh, global outliers, you're going to have people who want, to, want and aspire to being part of that, that you know, new, modern, you know, outperformance Japan. But it's a little bit risky there, and it's not for everyone. And you might also see sort of a countervailing force that puts people into their comfort zone. Uh, in 2009, Recruit did a survey uh, looking at the, uh, the preference uh, for uh, new job seekers in terms of what companies they wanted to join. They do it every year. And that year, the number right on the slipstream of the Lehman's bankruptcy, uh, that year, the number one company that uh, students graduating college wanted to join was Japan Railways Central. The number two company was JR East, right? and companies like and companies like Sony and Canon and look this right? Sony, Canon, and just trust me, Sony, Canon, and, and a third one and sharp, excuse me, that had been in the top 20 sunk below uh, the bottom 50 and were below Osaka Gas, right? not really known for their um, innovation. The, it doesn't take a lot to be harmed by this, right? Uh, a friend of mine who's lived in Japan for many years named David Mara talks about the kink. And the kink is the way he describes uh, a chart, a, a graph, a, a, a curve over time where there's just been a subtle change. He says, you, the, the kink is actually really dangerous because you might think that if Japan is looking like this and it now just tips like this, that it's only small, it's only about one degree. But it's sort of like walking or it's like geological surveys where if you're off by one degree, you're only a few inches away, but over time, because it sort of compounds, you're miles away from where you want to be. So Japan has to be, I think, very cautious about what the, if this happens, extreme Japan, has to be cautious about it because it might affect the kink. The growth rate, the curve, might just subtly dip a little bit. And if it is, we're already in a parallel situation. If it does dip, it could be more dangerous over time. So what can be done about it? Well, the first question to that question is, is it a problem? Right? Um, what it looks like is that Japan is becoming more and more of a normal country, if you will, normal defined as looking a lot more like other Western countries, other industrialized countries, or post-industrialized countries, if you will. Um, we see this in America, right? We have uh, Detroit, does not look very good. We have Silicon Valley, where the sun is always shining. Um, however, it is going to be new for Japan. Uh, it's going to, I think it might mean that Japan is going to have to exist where it's not totally comfortable in a sort of area of ambiguity for itself. Now, Japan lives in lots of different stages of ambiguity, but also I think it's a, cult, a society that likes things that are black and white, uh, and likes things that are sort of binary in this way. They want the right answer, not the wrong answer. This is sort of a paradox, it's a contradiction, and it's, I think it might be hard for the society to live with and to see. It's hard for most societies to do that, but we sort of are capable to. It's now may indeed come to Japan. Um, in America, we see this very clearly when we think about medicine, right? We have uh, what is arguably the best medical treatment in the world. When Steve Jobs uh, needed to have his entire genome scanned and sequenced with which his doctors could actually um, attack 
not his cancer, not his, not a, his symptoms and his cancer, as it was attacking his body, they could actually watch what was going on as it was progressing. He said to himself he was, that he was going to either be the, the, the last person to die of this disease or the first person to be saved by this, from this disease. Unfortunately, it, was the, it probably will be neither, um, but that was optimistic. But it's clear that America is the very best, or arguably the best, uh, medicine in the world. But at the same time, it's at, it's at the worst level of the worst, inter worst level of industrialized countries in terms of coverage of health care for people. And we, and America, if you will, has to live with this. It's America is the home of the brave, right? actually, maybe or may not be the home of the brave, but the point is that America is the home of the free, or at least liberty is the most exalted ideal for an American, but at the same time it imprisons, you know, a gobsmacking number of uh, people, largest by far in of, of the OECD, um, and most of them, unfortunately, African Americans. Um, the, that contradiction exists, uh, that paradox exists in American society. It's not going to be as extreme as that, if you will, in Japan. But I would think that Japan is probably going in the direction more towards this sort of bifurcation of society, a paradox. So too, Japan might be, in some ways, health companies that are the best, places that are going to be the richest, things that are going to be the nicest. At the same time, it's going to be, in some ways, uh, the worst. It's going to be, perhaps, decrepit in parts. It's going to be alien and falling apart. If you will, there's an image that sticks with me. I was in Hakone a few years ago at a conference, and I went up a cable car uh, while I was staying at a, at a nice place. And I went up to the cable car to the top of this mountain. And when I got to the top, as I was going up, I was seeing an image of Mount Fuji. And of course, it was inspiring, etc. Uh, when we got to the very top of the, of the summit station, it looked like um, it looked like Kabul in Afghanistan. I mean, prior to the invasion, I mean, when it was just pure rubble, um, it it made you not want to get back onto the gondola to go back down the station. It was a wreck. I my my words cannot do justice to the the depravity of this small, awful, odious, falling apart um, summit station. The only one who could is Spike Japan who is a blogger that you should all read. I admire him. I'm a victim of him. I understand he's in the audience tonight, lurking among <laughs> us. But it would take someone of his, uh, of his uh, wordsmithing to fully appreciate the degree to which you have these extremes in Japan, where you're going to have such exalted beauty, yet at the same time, things that are crumbling apart. Again, we've seen this in other countries. Gated communities exist in lots of places where you might have you know, shanty towns and slums, while great riches. Again, it's not going to be like that in Japan. It'll be its own special way. But it's not, the world of Japan is not going to look like it exists today. It will change. These are the thoughts that I've had for the last five years, bumbling my way through this wonderful country. As I've done it, I've relied on so many people who've trod the path before me, so much wiser than me, many of them in this room here tonight. For that, I thank you for all of your wise counsel, helping me learn things about this great place, making lots of mistakes. And with that, I want to thank you, and I say goodbye to Japan, but I will be watching it and seeing how it develops. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. You have made no mistakes in your final oral examination here. So you will get an A from Temple University, and maybe an honorary degree, if we can arrange this. Um, we uh, encourage the audience to ask questions, and they may or may not get an answer. Uh, so uh, you will take the mic, so raise your hand, and the mic will be distributed to whoever deserves it. And then I think we'll answer for this one. Oh, sure. Yes. Easy. Yeah. Excellent talk. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I have a comment, I guess. You, you talked about bifurcation within a company. You talked about uh, TDK and the Olympus. And I happen to sell to Japanese electronics companies, large, medium, small. And uh, I asked the same question to them. And uh, two of them answered succinctly. He said, Koike-san, I know what to do. What we need to do is to fire the half of the people in Japan, move the design and the assembly to China. We're profitable. They said, we can't do that. So in other words, that the, what he told me is that the purpose of Japanese company is not only make money, but to provide stable employment. 
And when you do that, you just can't cut out the old business. I think that's why you're seeing that the TDK and the Olympus hanging out the old business just to maintain employment. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a great uh, question and one that I, um, I wrestle with as well. I personally believe that the, the Japan has it a little bit more right than wrong. Uh, and uh, let me put it in a narrow example. Essentially what, what we're seeing in this crisis is that the economy is so arranged that companies would prefer to shed the risk of corporate profitability on the least vulnerable actors in the economy, the individual. They fire you know, X percentage, 10 percent of their staff, they remain profitable, they get all the benefits from the stock market, but for what it means for families, what it means for for society, what it means for real estate prices when people have to move because they can't make mortgage payments is totally terrible. And if you were to, again, accept, accept the kink, right, you actually would have a low, you would have underperformance, if you will, on the corporate sector, but you would have outperformance on all those other things that you don't measure in terms of all the benefits of society, um, less divorce rates, um, uh, stronger communities, people who are coaching Little League, right, and, you know, householders, um, a, a much pl more pleasant life because you're not, you're not filled with the anxiety that you're going to lose your job. And I think Japan does that extremely well. But it, I don't think it has to be quite so either or. Uh, what you can do is you can say uh, when there's small problems, even if maybe not when there's big problems, um, you have to fix it. You cannot be underperforming. You can't not make money. And maybe that pressure would do well. You might have to administer small medicine to avoid larger medicine. That is to say, you know, you know if you can, you know, you know, remove part of the organ as difficult that is, that means that you don't have to bury the cadaver later. An example of that would be Fujifilm and Kodak, right? Why did one go bankrupt and the other not? Well, both were fit, both of the exact same market shares in the domestic market. Uh, both were near monopolists uh, in, this, uh, in one of the most profitable businesses of the 20th century, film development, about 80% profit margins or so. And uh, they both faced the same headwinds of digital uh, imaging which the profit margins were going to just shrivel up, just no future for it. Strangely enough, um, the, the, the you know, Harvard MBA playbook was inverted, right? Fujifilm act, acted like an American company and administered really a dramatically difficult um, medicine, while Kodak sort of you know, meandered into its future trying little half measures and eventually, a few months ago, filed for bankruptcy. Now, if you were to go to Fujifilm, uh, just in Rapungi Midtown and talk to the bosses, you know, they will tell you it wasn't easy. They had to break long-standing relations. They had to disempower executives. They had to fire a huge amount of people. It was really difficult for those people. On the other hand, if you talk to lots of employees, they still have, I'm trying to guess, I think about 40,000 employees still. Um, it's, an, it, it's, it's going through a headwind because of the um, global economy has been merciless to lots of different companies, and it's one of them. Nevertheless, it's in a far different place. It's an extremely strong place as a company. The company survived. 40,000 people have uh, employment today that, if you look at Kodak, they don't. So I don't think it has to be so stark. I think that um, the right manager, both the right manager with the right um, principles, I think that the principles are going to be tougher, would manage it better. They would, on one hand, force through, you know, demand better performance when things are going poor, but hopefully wouldn't be so rapacious as to fire people and create all the social ills that that comes with. Yeah. Um, I noticed you haven't said that much, and maybe it's deliberate about the sort of politics. Wait, no, we need to... Oh. Yeah. Sorry, oh, sorry. Get the mic. I was just saying, I noticed you haven't said that much about sort of politics in Japan. <coughs> I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about how the political situation or system might be impacting upon the sort of situation you described. Yeah, it's a good question. I tried. I, on one hand, I wanted to include more things into it, like politics, like media, like the criminal justice system, things that I've been thinking about and working on for the last few years. I, I, I didn't want to put any of those reflections into it because I figured if I, it was more narrow, it was a cleaner argument, and those things just sort of seemed to get muddled, and I'd be kind of fitting in sort of a thesis that applied in one domain, business, into these new areas that didn't seem like it was appropriate. If I was to think about it now, I think the politics are, are just, is very different. I mean, it, it, it's messy, uh, and it's, as Jerry Curtis likes to say, it's in the process of creative destruction where something's being destroyed, but something else is being created, and we don't know when and where and all. 
but I don't, I don't see, a, I, I have to say, I'd have to, I'd have to think more about it uh, before I kind of ventured to see a relationship between extreme Japan on uh, the economic realm applied to politics. Uh, on the other hand, um, this is a good time to ask if anyone has any thoughts on that. Uh, shout it out, do you? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I was really just to okay. get some sort of your, your reflections on that. But okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, good. I'd like to challenge uh, one of the, not challenge, but add to the way your ideas that you had about uh, picking winners and losers of places and of companies, and you pointed out that with companies it's extremely difficult to predict winners and losers because what looks like a sure loser turns out to be a winner, and what looks like a sure winner turns out to be a loser, Kodak being an excellent example, or Apple being an example. I want to go over back to your demographic example about where you're talking about the continued growth of Tokyo with the depopulation of, of actually most of Japan. Uh, and there's some very interesting, you know, sort of looking at these different demographic patterns, and there's no guarantee, I would think, that Tokyo is going to continue to grow, particularly if the demography of, of Japan as a whole drops by, let's say, 50 percent, population drops by 50 percent by the end of this century. And among other people, there are various people that argue about this, but, you know, again, I, I do most of my work, I should mention, in Akita, where TDK is the last surviving of an industrial dinosaurs. Uh, that the most of the dinosaurs have become extinct. Actually, they've gone to Korea and, and Thailand. But um, you could argue that, in fact, places like Akita have been depopulating for the last half century and have made a series of adaptions and adjustments to depopulation, whereas Tokyo hasn't. And Tokyo, in fact, it could be very much look like a car going off a cliff. Uh, and there's no attempt by the Japanese government whatsoever to make any pre-adaption to a changing demographic pattern. And if, in fact, that's true, then your place that's going to be successful is not going to be the metropolitan center, but rather probably one of the peripheral cities, Sapporo, Fukuoka, some other place that has made an adjustment, not, not Tokyo. Because you seem to be presuming that Tokyo is going to continue to keep growing. If, if the population of Japan by the end of the century drops to, let's say, 65 million, mm -hmm. sure, sure. no, Tokyo is not going to continue growing. Okay, let me ask. Um, it doesn't have to, it, population growth is, is important, but what if the what, what if there's no population growth, but the wealth still comes to Tokyo? It, it gets a disproportionate amount of money. Like he should, should probably still keep the mic. Um, how do, how would that uh, how would that kind of jive with what you're saying? That makes it a little more complicated because I would argue that right now the reason that the greatest wealth comes into Tokyo is mostly because of government policies that this has been a long-standing policy issue to basically suck into the center uh, resources from the periphery. and uh, This is something that's been mandated actually since the early Meiji. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, sure. But anyway, if white, that can do... White, White-collar professional work. Mm -hmm. White-collar white professional work that's probably going to be slightly more globalized than, um, than elsewhere. Well, it could be. I mean, I, again, I'm, I'm agreeing that it's hard to predict yeah, yeah. at all. You know, you use the model of Kochi, for example, having two million yen income versus Tokyo, it's, Four million, but I would also point out that living in Kochi on two million yen is a lot easier than sure. living in Tokyo on four million. So wealth is a, a <laughs> yeah, yeah you know, li living in four. You know, it's it's a it's a relative item, and it's it's hard to. I, I, I'm actually arguing, or not arguing. I'm, I'm suggesting that this is really hard to pick winners and losers yeah. because we do have multiple factors that are operating in different directions. And if wealth were to continue to come into Tokyo, I mean, it seems to me if I'm making a business and I want to make widgets then I might want to make widgets in Kochi rather than in Tokyo, particularly if you're talking about land prices, yada, da, 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 da. Now, of course, you have really weird things like your, your group of companies who wants to have expensive energy costs. Yeah. Right. So, da, da, da. <laughs> but, but they make their own energy. Well, that helps. They're, they're, just, they're just harming the residential consumers who don't have the choice. But that's, that's a kind of wild card of which Japan, I, I, I tend to agree with your overall look at Japan, very positive. I've been here a long time, and I, I think it's a, it's a fascinating place. But it makes it almost impossible to predict winners and losers because there's so many of these wild cards. It's like you have a set of two jokers and 52 cards. You have 52 jokers and two cards. Um, well, I, I agree that it's hard, but I just don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's that hard. I mean, I... <clears throat> yeah, I don't think it's 52 jokers and... and well, two, okay, then well, you're, you're predicting yeah. then that Tokyo is going to continue to be dominant into the foreseeable future. I think that's a safe bet. I mean, I, I, I take your point. I mean, of course, I don't have a crystal ball, so, and nor do you, but no one has a monopoly on it either. So we don't know. I think it's very intriguing. Right? I'm not, I, I absolutely don't disagree with you whatsoever. I do, but I, kind of my, 
you know, it's like they say, you know, the, the race doesn't go to the swift nor the, you know, the victory to the thing, but that's the way to bet, right? The same way, it's like it's, there's no certainty that Tokyo is going to do well, but I'd still put my money on, on, the, on the city. Yeah. That there's, a, there's a lot to that as well, right? I mean, skewing the, the, the playing field also you know, is a good betting strategy. Uh, anyone? Thank you for your talk today. Um, you were speaking about, um, how to say, uh, a coexistence of extremes. And I'm wondering, is that really so? I mean, I think that the industry has grown very strongly and is now being strangled by demographics and maybe um, also not so good politics. I mean, uh, is my understanding wrong here? Say the question, say the question more, because I, I want to develop what you're saying. Uh, so, yeah, well, um, so I just doubt that it's a, a, a coexistence uh, per se, I believe that basically first we have had uh, an industry growing very strongly um, and that now uh, the tides are basically turning and, and step and, uh, step to certain um, things which have kept uh, companies stable and alive uh, is now outdated in the changing of the world, the globalization, and that now the mindset should change, but it doesn't. And there are other factors which are kind of, as you pointed out yourself, strangling. Uh, the dinosaurs and mm. companies like uh, Rakuten and uh, SoftBank are orienting themselves at global standards rather than um, local standards. So, just wondering, is my understanding wrong? Because I don't believe it's a coexistence um, uh, of extremes rather than it's just a, a kind of like a transition. Uh, it, it could be. I'm more optimistic than that. Uh, the reason why is that I look at uh, Japan relative to a lot of other companies around the world, and what I do see is that Japan can do things that other companies just simply cannot do, right? So the, I mean, the example is, um, in just, I think, post uh, 311 up in Tohoku, looking at the degree to which um, things, you know, arcane things like the the black tint to a paint was um, all based uh, in I think the Iwate Prefecture by a strange company named Merck, unrelated to the pharmaceutical company, and that for you know six months people couldn't uh, buy tuxedo black cars that hadn't that needed to be made since the quake because they didn't have enough of the supply. I mean, it's just these really really weird and strange things. Part of it is um, is that they just happen to be based here. It's a fluke, right? You could make that paint somewhere else, but there's a lot of other things, particularly if it's kind of an innovation that relies on the previous innovation that's transmitted through latent knowledge rather than sort of a patent and overt knowledge that you can then transmit in a kind of a recipe book. Things that require, um, well, I don't mean latent, I mean tacit knowledge. Um, a lot, a lot of uh, manufacturing. The reason why it's based here is because that you know, 55 year old men train 22 year old men uh, to become th you know, 33 and at 65 they retire and after 10 years these people can start doing it for themselves. And I've gone to factory after factory after factory uh, watching this process, seeing it, seeing the great benefits of lifetime employment uh, in certain industries and sectors that relied on this sort of knowledge to be passed down, almost art artisanal knowledge from one generation to another that allowed companies to do amazing things. I'll give you one like super arcane example. Uh, there's a company called NSK in Gifu, and what they do is they make the they make a lot they like everything they make like 150,000 products, and one of them are pulleys, uh, and they make custom made pulleys. Now everyone can design and mass produce the little like circle thing on the pulley, but not anyone can do it with incredibly exacting specifications for the most extraordinary pulley mechanism that you need, whether it's going into a robot in space or whether it's going onto a, um, a $50 million machine that's at a construction site in Dubai to, to do something and it broke down and every day the production's not working, it loses $10 million so they need it in 24 hours. Uh, and this company can do it. They view what they're doing like sushi chefs that they can just sort of, it's not like they mass produce it, they'll give that to China and elsewhere. They want to make the world's best little otoro of a, of a pulley thing. Um, among the things that they do, 
is after they do all their, their casting and hammering and all that stuff to their big steel products, they put it out in the, um, in the, in the climate, in the, uh, just outside in a small area where their very beautiful corporate headquarters are for part of some odd months of the year at a certain time of year, and they change it and turn it in different areas. And, and the reason that they're doing it is they say that the metal changes somehow when it gets a coat of rust on it, and it sort of, it, the properties of the metal improve by putting it outside, right, um, and doing these interesting things with it. Now, I'm sure that there's some science that backs it up. I'm sure that a lot of people think that this is just wasteful and ridiculous and laugh at it. But the company's been around for 200 years, and it's one of the most important companies in the world. And if you have a, this, any of these sort of weird needs for these pulleys, there's really no other co company in the world that you can call but this one company. And the weird thing is that I visit these companies like once a month, right? I'm seeing it everywhere in Japan. It's a very interesting phenomenon, so it makes me think that there is this weird little special area of, J of corporate Japan that has these characteristics of outperformance. And we even see that on the stock market. I mean, um, Ulrika Schrada, the professor, has spoken here before, showing her vision of the new Japan companies that, have, that are, make tons of money because they dominate these small niches. That's, that's well known. The idea is that I think that we're going to see that uh, continue, uh, and it's not just going to be a one-way ticket down Please. The, the, mic, the mic has to be yeah. distributed. First of all, thank you for the uh, talk. Uh, so my question is, uh, Japan is known as an anomaly, especially during the miracle years, say the 60s, 70s, and even the late 80s. And what led partly to the miracle years was the Iron Triangle, the perfect coordination between government, bureaucracy, and the companies. And uh, they use their innovation and mass production to topple some of the leading Western economies, say US and a lot of economies in Europe. And somewhere in mid 90s, they lost their way, they lost their edge on innovation. So, what stops Japan in to recreate that magic of Iron Triangle? I there's a couple answers to it. The first one is uh, nothing inherently needs to stop it. Secondly, is, is that still the optimal way to design an economy? And then thirdly, is, is, the, iron, is the importance of the Iron Triangle um, over, overstated today? That we like to look at it and we presume that that's the reason why things are so good. But in fact, that kind of neatly summarizes things where reality is a lot more messy and not really true. Um, as one small example, Calvers Johnson uh, looked at METI and concluded that it was the strong hand of the developmental state that allowed for you know the car industry to take off, the electronics industry to take off, and all these great benefits. But when you look at it on the micro level and talk to the companies and executives, a lot of them were like, yeah, well, we were doing this and we had to go to these ponderous meetings with these complete idiots in Kasumi Gaseki, and so they want us to do this. And so we sent all of our B-string people there just to bow politely and drink their tea while we did what we wanted to do anyway, and we did great. And Honda, of course, was famously a company that was kind of out of favor. The bureaucrats didn't want to give it any money and, and actually didn't think they could make any cars, and of course they ended up making cars. Sony was an example. Sony couldn't even import the materials that they needed to make their first cassette tapes. The way that they did it, Masayoshi saw is he took basically strips of very, very thin plastic or sort of a similar sort of material as plastic that would be used for it, and he had to drip on the ferrous magnetic tape um, gunk, that's the formal term, um, onto the stuff and then kind of smoothen it out. And that's how he made his first cassette tape with which to demo his tape cassette player when he went to America to demo it for people as well as to demo it here in Japan. So there's no reason why, there's no inherent reason why Japan can't recreate it if they wanted it to. I think it'd be hard to do, it might not be very useful to do, but, uh, and it may not be the full reason for Japan's miracle, but they could gamble that way. And I'm sure there's a lot of people in Kasumi Gaseki who would quite like to you know, relive those glory years. It works when you're catching up, but it doesn't work once you're at top level. That's, yeah. It works when you're catching up, when you've got somebody else to target, but you no longer have anybody else to target, it doesn't work. That was going to be my counter argument. Okay. <laughs> Good job. I'm going to get tagged the mic. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. When I was praising all of the sources in this room, if my eyes were fixed on tagging. Okay, thank you. I'm John from Hirozubashi University. 
Uh, I'm, I'm also come from Taiwan, so I'm happy that you mentioned uh, Stanley's smart curve and uh, the, the semiconductor industry. Um, so, like recently, many Taiwanese like electronic suppliers they uh, are realizing that they are struggling to make profit. So they just try to move their their operations to China, either for like huge market opportunity or focusing on brand management like H like HTC that making smartphones compete with iPhones. So I would say 99% of the traditional electronic companies they are still struggling with low profit. So I would I would like to ask what specific recommendations would it give to this kind of company? I guess the the answer would apply to many Japanese suppliers as well. In order for them to strive to uh, thrive for the next 10 years. So for Taiwanese electronics companies, what would be sort of how how would I take this analysis and apply it to them that would give them would be an answer for what they might want to do. Right. I don't know. Um, <coughs> no, no idea. I mean, I, I could give you lots of reasons why I could I can I, I could talk for I can give you a 15 minute answer on how what my thought process is to come to the conclusion. No idea. I want to short circuit that. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Ken. Sorry. I'm Jason Shaw from the Australian Embassy. Um, yesterday you were at a, another conference uh, at Cotova and you, you chaired a panel um, on, on innovation and sustainability. Um, and thank you for that. It was very interesting. But I, I'm just kind of drawing a link from... Was I consistent? You, you were, okay. actually. And, and I think, um, I, I guess, uh, a little bit of what you're saying today, um, this, this idea that, um, that Japan has succeeded uh, where, where the world has kind of remained the, the same and they've, they've gotten very good at, uh, at striving at, you know, these... They've, they've become very good at, at doing their one thing when the world is stable and when the world changes, um, these companies will change with... Those companies which survive and innovate and, and, ch and change with their, their environment they, they seem to do well, like your rapid, you know, your, your up tens and your, your sons. But I, I guess, I don't know whether you, you agree with this, but I, I, I'm hearing what you heard, what you were talking about yesterday and what, what you're presenting today is sort of linked in the way that if, if a company in Japan can innovate and change with the times, then that they, they have a high chance of actually surviving in the future. If, if a company gets to the size and gets to the, uh, I guess, the the scale in which they can't change anymore, then then when the world changes around them, they they, they struggle to to move forward. W would this would this be something that you would agree with? Yes, um, I would. It's uh, I think that that's I think that's right. It, it, it would be almost um, that should be sort of ingested in almost all corporate managers. I think it is really sort of the ethos that we teach in you know. American business schools are certainly at the West Coast. Everyone kind of, kind of comes out minted uh, with that sort of ideology and, and goes forth. But it's amazing the degree to which um, it's really hard to put that into practice, and people aren't really aware that they're making a mistake. A way of putting it, of phrasing it, is just adaptability, right? Or or iteration, right? Um, that we have to, that you might want to treat um, management or corporate strategy like gardening, in which you don't. You know you've got lots of tools in the shed, right? You've got fertilizer here. You've got sunlight that you want to put in. You can water at certain times, but you don't want to water at others. Uh, you need to do some pruning. That means cutting things, right? Um, you might also want to clear a patch and get rid of something else so other things can grow. But you're only doing that in the context of the environment. What's actually happening to the plant right then and there, based on what's happening um, in the, in the climate in the environment at the time. But that's not the way that businesses operate, right? You come up with a, you know, an annual one-year plan, you present it to investors, you have um, in your annual report, you, in Japan you have a mid-term plan, right? Um, Masayoshi saw famously in the year 2000 had a 1,000-year plan for SoftBank, right? And, it's, and other companies have similarly interesting things as well. But generally this idea, which should be really intuitive, and I think that one reason why the, if there is one reason why output performance does exist in Japan, they're usually because it's founder CEOs who are sort of the boss and everyone sort of falls in line to. So maybe there is, you can decrypt it on that basis, you know, a very strong leader who has skin in the game, not like the salaryman's chat show, as they call them, the CEOs that come in. Um, 
so you would, so they are really, they're genba, as they say in Japan, right, in Japanese. They're, they're kind of in the factory floor, they're watching things, they're doing things, and they're constantly responding to the environment. And you would want that to happen. It's not impossible. You can design your corporate hierarchy to actually try to eliminate the stasis that comes from scale, right? Um, they're really, really hard to do, particularly because, you know, you'll have, maybe, I'm sure if you ask the executives of Kodak, they will promise you up and down that they're, Managing like gardeners, right? You know, a la Couquier, and they're doing everything that, correct. And of course, they fail because they mislead themselves. Um, it's a common trait. So I think it's it's hard to escape that. But I think the adaptability, almost like a Darwinianness nature of it, um, is a, is the kind of the principle for running a company. Yeah. Well, I guess that leads me to the second question. What what about Japan is is not adaptable um, for for those who have failed and and is adaptable? for those who have succeeded. Don't know, but let's think about the different features of a Japanese company and then try to ask how it fits on the adaptability scale. So one is going to be relationships, right? Um, they seem really tight, right? They, would, they want a few tight relationships, not many weak relationships. Um, at Panasonic, um, when you join, they ask you, um, what is your Sumitomo Mitsui bank account number so that we can pay you? Right? You're not allowed to give a, a Mitsubishi bank you know, bank account number. I mean, if you, you, you can, if you feel very daring. But the fact is, in the 1920s, uh, Panasonic Mats Matsushita was almost bankrupt. And it was, uh, Sumitomo was the only bank that gave it a bank loan. And even in its corporate um, headquarters, uh, uh, museum, you see, you know, you know, a small little Sumitomo corner of, you know, where they're praising the bank and the strong relationship with their bank. Um, so, in terms of adaptability of the relationships, um, it seems like it's less flexible than we'd have in the West. Um, let's think of other features of, of the Japanese company. In terms of uh, human resources, it's a little bit mixed, right? It used to be very inflexible. There was a lifetime commitment. Not lifetime employment, but lifetime commitment is a better way of thinking about it. Um, that has gone away. It still exists, but it's gone away quite a bit. Um, the so and that that may you might in hindsight say that that spared them by tinkering with that. Other features of the of the company. I'd have to think more about it to kind of. I don't want to do it on the fly because I'll probably say something stupider than I have already. But uh, but you have you do have to wonder about. I mean. I spend all my days, you know, kind of astonished at how, quote unquote, stupid Japanese companies are. Don't they understand they should be doing this? Don't they understand they should be doing that, doing this, right? I, I diss department stores for how ridiculous they are. Mitsukoshi, you know, how can they possibly exist? They've existed since the 1600s, thank you very much. <laughs> right? um, so there, there, there's something there, again, I want to, like what I said at the beginning, that there's something imperceptible, uh, particularly to, to an absolute outsider like me. Um, that is going on here that they can do and and frankly I guess here's maybe the humblingest part maybe just being above average is out or actually maybe just hitting average is out performance in a world of difficulties vagaries and troubles right if you can just be above break even forever you never go bankrupt and no matter how well you hit your numbers if you're an American company at 5% 10% like Kodak over time um, if you're managing for outperformance and you fail and you stumble, the risks are too great and you plummet. Now, I would argue that progress on a societal level happens because of outperformance, because the gains that are, that are captured by society are, are always going to be greater than the gains that are captured by one single company, search engines and Google, for example. Um, but from a corporate perspective, maybe uh, all you need to do is, again, be a blood break even and you live forever. Um, you need a mic. Uh, yeah. Where is it? But, oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. Oh, go back outside. Oh, that's okay. Uh, I'm sorry to, that I know you are leaving Japan because upcoming events are so will be much more exciting. Because it was yesterday, a vice governor of Tokyo, municipal government, told us that a lot condition is ahead. If the big earthquake hits Tokyo. Then it will be 30-day-long power out 
no sh no food no food water shortage. But an upcoming event to happen in April is the possibly entire atomic power stations seizure in Japan. So entire these series of difficulties or crises. How could possibly the Japanese corporation could survive? Because 65% of the Tokyo Stock Exchange listed corporations are centralized in Tokyo. And Tokyo will be in the in midst of the chaos, for sure within a seven year, seven year time. So I have a skepticism about the Japanese corporation. If they can survive, and also the profitability, as you mentioned, is getting worse. And rally in Tokyo Stock Exchange is only played by the offshore investors who could stay in Tokyo overnight or just one week. Without them, Tokyo Stock Exchange market is continuously shrinking. But you think about the future of the Japanese economy in the short term under these difficulties. I, my mind always goes, I think of 311, and my mind always goes back to the essay that Robert Dujarek wrote at that time in which he said, if you have to be stuck on a Shinkansen for 18 hours, do it in Japan. Uh -huh. Is that right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. On a train. On a train. Okay. It wasn't, it wasn't a Shinkansen. Shinkansen and then a train. And then a train. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it's a delightful essay. You should all reread it. Um, the, uh, the, you know, it's just an extraordinary uh, country that pulls together in times of crises. In fact, maybe one of the, the curses of Japan is that uh, they have a sense that it's, it's only in times of crisis that they self-realize and, and they, you know, they rise to the fore and that, you know, it's a banality that Japanese have been saying this to themselves for so long that if only we had a crisis um, that they would, that things would improve. And of course, unfortunately, fate did give them a crisis and the jokers in, in Nagatacho did not rise to the occasion. Um, so, uh, I, I, you know, in in, my, in thinking through these issues at the outset, before I kind of put pen to paper and thought of the, um, what I was going to remark to my remarks today, but also, and which was sort of the culmination of my thinking for so many years, um, I came to the conclusion that Japan could afford to have a, um, a weak politics because it had such a strong society. A lot of other countries have that inverted, right, my own in particular. So um, I think that, you know, per, I think the country going will, will do fine, right? In in times of crises, in fact, that's when you really see it pulling together. Yeah, I, I, I like to second that you said bifurcation. Somebody asked. So, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I like to second that the, the, about the weak politics and somebody asked about by, and about politics and bifurcation, and uh, this this country of uh, the most advanced fiber optic optical communications, unlimited mobile minutes and uh, where the use of internet and use of telephone is prohibited in the government election system. So politics is decided by word of mouth, uh, screaming at the uh, you know, city corners. No use of uh, Twitters, no use of emails whatsoever. And I, I have not even spoken about the media. If, if, if I can make one yeah. comment. I think what should be done is to allow the internet and bound loudspeakers at street corners. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I second that. <laughs> Tack. Um, what you've said this evening um, reinforces, I think, what the regret that we all feel that you're leaving. Um, the, uh, I actually, the question back there was, was pretty much along the lines of what I wanted to ask, but um, the, uh, you know, this, this 311, the, the natural disaster, natural disasters have a way of shining a spotlight on the weaknesses of, of political setups. I mean, we saw this, I mean, people say that the collapse of the Soviet Union happened as a result of Chernobyl. Um, the Bush administration never recovered from Katrina. Um, stuff is coming out now about 311, particularly the response to the um, to the problems of the power plant um, that are really frightening. Um, that the system came, the system, the Japanese system came close, as close to meltdown, um, uh, with TEPCO essentially folding. And we gather that if it hadn't been for Khan taking a stand, um, talk of the evacuation of Tokyo and so forth. Um, I wonder if you have some thoughts on that, on how 
the, the reaction of the system to um, the nuclear power crisis, um, what that tells you about Japan going forward. So tough, right? Um, one hopes that it's the nadir, right? One hopes that that this was that that, and I, I guess one could have two schools of thought on this as well. Um, one version would be that uh, optimistically that Japan, the Japanese public, people see this as the as the low point of of the sort of. 20th century. I mean, it's like the last day of the 20th century was March 11th, 2011, because the whole system that was built up after the war finally was shown to be so brittle that we now can look back on it and say that um, that it, we were inches away from the destruction of Japan. Right. Um, the, what Tag is referring to is uh, what's now recently been revealed is TEPCO, uh, the head of TEPCO had informed the Kante, the Prime Minister's residence, that he was planning on evacuating all of his uh, employees from the plant and basically kind of saying that he couldn't actually fix it uh, and prevent what was already a, a, a meltdown occurring from actually getting worse and that he just had to, because it would be human beings would just die if they were there, which would require, which would mean a lot more spread, it would be a problem you couldn't really control. Well, it, it, as I understand it, it would have been... Can we get the mic in my as I understand it, if that plant had been there, probably, well, certainly people here know more than I do, but yeah. if the plant had actually been evacuated the way that the president of TEPCO was asking, it would have meant that two other nuclear power plants would also have to have been evacuated, and that in turn would have, right. have led, have forced the government to evacuate Tokyo. That's right, and the Fudabashi report, which was recently released, um, yeah. called it demonic uh, chain reaction. Right. Um, that's right, so, you, and, and uh, elsewhere, I'm not forgetting the source, but, um, uh, uh, Prime Minister Khan, I don't remember now, Prime Minister Khan t told a friend of his in early April that if that had happened, that it would have been the quote-unquote end of Japan. Okay, so, um, so you'd hope that that's sort of the low point, and there's a lot of evidence to think that that is, that um, the Japanese look at the, the brittleness of their institutions, why it was, it was so failing, and that, they, and that they have to rebuild it, they have to improve it, and that they're going to do that. On one level, they're going to, they've given, in some ways, they're so resigned to having terrible politics and they've given up on it that they're doing it for themselves, so there's a new spirit of self-reliance. Um, on the other hand, um, there's a new uh, integrity in the way that they look at uh, those in authority, and they have mistrust. That's not a very good thing ever to have in any political environment, but it's useful, right? I mean, think about mistrust in the Western setting, right? Montesquieu, the checks and balances, right? We presume, you know, Lord Acton presumes that power is going to corrupt, and so we create institutions that allow that to happen. So if you, if you actually mask that on to Japanese society, look at what's happening with the prosecutors today, and subject that's dear to me, legal rights, right? We've seen prosecutorial malfeasance for years in Japan, right? Most convictions are based on self-confessions, right? Well, all confessions are self right? but confessions, and um, uh, that, that are clearly coerced. Right, um, and of course, Ozawa famously is now going to probably not see any. All the, ch the chief charges against Ozawa are going to be dismissed because the prosecutor doctored the evidence, and there was evidence of that. And of course, it's, we, every year there's a new scandal of the prosecutors. They they rule with a sort of arbitrariness. Right, they kind of are more powerful than God. Um, think of now, but just look at all the institutions of Japan. Olympus. The Tokyo Stock Exchange has the right to list to delist a company, right? So it's done in the most subjective way possible, based on favoritism. I would argue favoritism. You know, um, uh, live door out, young entrepreneur, right? But Kikakawa-san of Olympus, uh, that's fine. You know, so um, and that subjectivity, the rules that are unwritten, or at least the the room, the structural setup where room for subjectivity clearly um, is good if you're making the wise decisions, but it's terrible if it gets misused, and the risk is that it's going to get misused. We may see uh, the healthy nature of mistrust on the political setting. Right now, you don't have, you know, Jerry Curtis's creative destruction is that you don't, if you're trying to build something, but you've got a really bad hand, right? You've not been dealt a lot of good players. So you have to wait, you have to play the round a few more times, and you've got to get better players, right? That's the positive one. The negative one is that, 
um, Japan is uh, it, Japan has just been has given up the fight, right? It's just become a bit soft. You've got a floating uh, retirement home, and um, you and the people just they're resigned, they're cynical, they just want to get on with their lives, and they're going to like and for they have a political tradition which they've left to at one time the man, samurai and the daimo, then to the mandarins that came from that same class, the game of politics, and they're going to do the same as well. And there will be pernicious consequences, and Kobe and and uh, and. Uh, Tohoku will be a better response than Kobe and still wildly imperfect, and the next quake will be a better response than Tohoku but still wildly imperfect, and life will go on and we'll just muddle through. We are going to find out. You know, we have a great natural experiment taking place on which one will reign. I'm going to try and keep this short. Um, I wonder sometimes whether we, um, like your old friend said, we uh, write off Japan too easily or we, we hold the country up to a standard that we don't hold others. Um, for instance, socially, I mean, we don't get the riots that we've had in London or Paris or um, what's going on in Greece. Japan is fairly stable socially. Um, economically, um, I guess there are, I don't know, 200 countries in the world, but Japan is still in, in the uh, top three. Um, I work in uh, intellectual property and Japan still um, outpatents most countries apart from the US. Um, so in terms of innovation, I mean you have to be um, in innovative to be um, applying for patents. For instance, um, it's part of the requirement of a patent application is that you have a novel idea. So there is still innovation in the country and um, in terms of um, you know, one company um, doing, having many products within this range. If you look at some of the giants of Japan, like um, Mitsubishi or Sony, uh, most of these companies do not start off making what they're, what they're currently famous for. I think, I think Sony started off making, I don't know, um, sewing machines or something. Um, and Mitsubishi, um, I think, was making something else. Um, and they played around with various brands and various ideas. Um, and they've succeeded. So I wonder if sometimes we hold Japan up to a very high level that we don't hold other countries and whether we write them off too soon. Yeah, I mean, you're always strictest with that which you love most, right? Um, I, would, I apply uh, higher standards to Japan in certain areas uh, than I would to my own country because I've written off so many elements of it as well, as much as I love it and participate in all of its foibles. So. Um, but I'm not too worried by that. You know, I think that um, it, 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 Solzhenitsyn, you know, criticized Russia, the Soviet Union, and then got booted out. He landed in America and criticized America. And all the Americans got all huffy and puffy about it. But the fact is, like, he's a critic. He's an intellectual. Like, you put him in a place and, he, you know, you wind him up and he does what he does. And I, 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 I know this very dearly because after 3.11, when I was going to all these press conferences at the, the Kante, um, I got into a lot of very uncomfortable conversations with a lot of people I care deeply about who work in the bureaucracy because I was the asshole in the room, right? Asking really tough questions uh, that made, that disturbed the law. But, um, and it seemed quite unfair, right? I mean, because I, you know, the, the, the subtext that they were too polite to say but one could sense is that, well, would America or would France or would Germany, or, you know, Singapore do better than our response? And what I had to sort of suggest is, you don't understand, I'm not the Singaporean correspondent, I'm the Japan correspondent, so whatever happens here, I'm going to just look at it with a fresh set of eyes and come to a conclusion with it right about. You know, the editor put me here, he wound me up, and I kind of look around and I look at all the good things and the bad things, and what I'm supposed to do is talk about it. And if I was in America, I would do the same thing, and I'd be wild. I'd be talking about criminal justice in America and the prison rate and all these other and handgun laws and all these other foibles of America or problems with America. And um, doing, I'm here and I'm doing the same thing. So I don't think it's a problem to um, put a standard, put a bar up, and then and examine how Japan meets it or underperforms it. Okay, uh, we've almost reached the end, so I'll take the advantage of sharing to ask the last question. Uh, 
When did you find, this is the first time you worked in Japan, right? Uh, yeah, lived and worked. I mean, worked yeah. professionally. What did you find the most difficult thing when you arrived as a, as a reporter, as a journalist? The most difficult thing, about the most, most interesting, fun, no, no, crazy, the most difficult, annoying, the most challenging, the most challenging thing, <laughs> professionally. Yeah, you know, there is a there is a, an element to that. Um, well, of course, interviews, because I I can't tell you how many times I've gone so far for an interview with which I got so little. <laughs> uh, the worst was probably in two thousand, early two thousand, well, two thousand, late two thousand nine to early two thousand ten. Um, Let's just say I went to Osaka. I won't. I won't embarrass the company. It took don't me. Don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. You're on your record. <laughs> That's, <it. laughs> That's the YouTube screen now. It was Osaka. Um, uh, it's, I have to be too polite. I've become Japanese. See, I've intuited all these things. I can't say. Uh, the I, I, it was about four hours to get there, four hours to get back, and um, and thirty and maybe an hour long interview. And I had my notebook at the end um, looked like this. Right? I mean, there was, just, there was nothing in it. And I could see the person, the, like, my minder from the public relations, just groaning. She, I mean, she herself could not believe the, 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 he was talking, right? He was saying words, right? It wasn't like, there was no, it's not like there was silence, right? But there was nothing to write down. And it was, it was this artful way of saying absolutely nothing. <laughs> and uh, so, and that, the, and of course, I made you know incredibly fun mistakes. Like once I um, I needed some information after an interview with someone, and he wrote back, um, it, it might be difficult. And of course, I just presumed that that meant it might be hard to do. And so I said, well, thank you for trying. I hope that's why I enriched what I was looking for and all. And he said it might be difficult. And, you know, I didn't actually understand that that was a code word for no. <laughs> um, and, there's, and there's lots of uh, enjoyable things like that. But the most amazing thing is. Um, I've been, mo almost everything that I know, well, actually everything I know about Japan generally comes from the Japanese themselves. And I, as I was, as I'm leaving, um, I realized that kind of what was going on. And one of them was almost a blunter than he ever was, which he was kind of was a, a very senior official uh, in a inst large, important institution, was begging me to write these things in The Economist and was feeding me information. And I, I kind of dawned on me that like, he just presumed, I, I don't want to say I was his savior, but he saw, it was, it was an absolute case of gaiatsu. It was, it was a Mandarin who knew that he and his cohort were only empowered by, by a, a foreign publication like The Economist pushing against something, not because we're just pushing, but like in the Meiji era, because the system was already ready to push it over themselves, but they needed sort of the, maybe just something from external for lots of different reasons that Japan benefits from that to kind of give them the, the, that extra little oomph, the, the snowflake that falls on the branch that brings the branch down um, of mo momentum there. And so although it's, the irony is that I've, I've gotten so little from so many you know, staged interviews, um, it's out drinking with some of these people that I'm given the family jewels, that they decrypt Japan for me. Um, and I know readers of The Economist coverage, uh, my colleague Henry Trix is here today, can attest that, you know, that it wasn't for a lot of people talking to us in context that they can't talk to other media, um, we wouldn't have been able to uh, give the coverage to the country that we have. Thank you very much. Uh, this is outstanding. As you know, we are a very poor university because the Ministry of Education denies us support and we are not a tax-exempt institution and uh, we sometimes ask our uh, participants to contribute to our donation box. I think last time we got 340 yen. Uh, so uh, so we, we, we want to give, give you a thank you gift, so we're giving you this latest facts about TUJ, our latest brochure of the press. So thank you so much. It's, it's a small gift, but it's all we can afford.